Hello. Hello. So, last Saturday at work, I decided to smoke this vape pen that I got over Christmas. I just realized my hair looks crazy because it is what it is. I decided to smoke this vape pen that contains THC. I think it's like 97% THC. And I am not, once again, it might be deceiving, but I am not someone who smokes weed at all. And I have only a few experiences with weed in the, in the past. And so I knew that being someone who doesn't do that regularly, the effect, you know, could be quite strong. And I thought, what better way to use this than at work? So I did. And in the past, the times that I did get high, I got paranoid every time. Either I didn't feel anything or I got paranoid. So I thought, that's just the effect it has on me. And, you know, I took a few puffs. It kicked in, middle of service, lunch, which is more hectic. And when it kicked in, I felt like I was getting paranoid for a bit. I thought, there it goes again. That was a mistake. And then I I think it's partly because I'm, you know, I've been doing my job for two years now and I'm so used to it that I am used to if the situation, for example, if something is going out of control, I am I am used to just taking a step back, taking a breath and observing and not panicking. You know, I'm used to that by now. And so I feel like doing it at work was the was a bright idea. Because in a weird way that's my area of comfort. It's an area that's quite chaotic that was extremely daunting at first for me. And now I would say that I have very much conquered it. And so I feel truly comfortable there in a way that I don't in most other places. You know, that's the thing about a 9 to 5 is once you do it for a while, you get very confident, comf uh, comfortable there. And it's much easier to do that than to chase after your dreams and to take risks and to build yourself up again in a different area. And so, you know, I thought I was getting a bit paranoid and then I took a breath, I slowed down, you know, I, I was getting on with my work and I realized what was happening after this initial you know, effect was that I, w it felt like I was, for a moment it felt like I could understand what was happening, you know, it was enhanced, that sense of understanding of what was happening around me. And then I realized that what was enhanced, in fact, was my ability to pay attention. I felt everything more strongly. And so it wasn't paranoia. It was that if I felt a sense of paranoia, that was enhanced. In the same way, if I felt a sense of happiness or of joy, that was enhanced because I was more aware of it. And, you know, I kind of... It feels like it happened so fast and so slow at the same time, but... You know, I went to a table, for example, and they were not talking to each other much especially when I approached. And usually what I do is that I want I want to talk to them. I always get this sense that I'm getting in the way, that I am disrupting. So I try not to talk too much. But I could sense, I, I could almost feel the man's presence, like his back was trying to attract me. Like I could feel that he wanted me to talk. Whereas in, in general, I would just keep going with the same narrative that I have in my head and that I, I have had for two years. They don't want me to bother them, so I shouldn't go there. And here I could notice you know, more clearly that what was happening is not that the guest was sending me a message that was negative, it's that, it's that me, I have this narrative in my head and I've decided to run with it when clearly the guest wanted me to interact with them. And this felt so obvious. I could sense you know, that the guy was waiting for me to approach to have a conversation or with any waiter. Whereas normally I would just take, you know, just accept, oh, he's not talking much, I'm not going to go there. They're not talking much to each other. 
and it highlighted a lot of things. I mean, imagine, it's a bit like the pill from Limitless, in a sense. It highlighted a lot of things that I do wrong be because I was more aware. For example, my posture. I feel like, especially at work, I stand up pretty straight. But I stand up 95% straight, really. You know, some people slouch, some people it's quite obvious. And I just kind of, I'm just a bit relaxed. And I felt like that was a mistake. I could feel like my body was weaker. Everything felt wrong the way I was standing. So I stood up straight in a way that, especially when you're high, I felt quite stupid. I thought, oh, everybody's going to be looking at me and thinking, why is he standing? You know, I thought I was standing, you know, in a crazy position. But in fact, I was just standing straight. And I felt aligned in a way I've never felt before. I felt like everything was right in the way I've, I was standing. I felt like my body was aligned. I felt like I was doing something right. And I could feel immediately, anytime my posture kind of went out of alignment, I could feel like my entire body was screaming at me. You know, why are you doing this? You're doing it wrong. That's not how you're supposed to stand. So posture was a big thing that was highlighted. My memory. I forget things all the time, especially short-term memory. You know, and we all get this. You walk into a room and then you forget immediately why you walked into that room. To me, that's just all the time. And for long-term memory as well. And I caught myself forgetting something. And I was more aware of it. And I thought, what happened here is that something happened and I didn't digest the information, I just went on to something else immediately. I skipped a step, so to speak. And so it, it highlighted the fact that the way I go about my day, my life, the way I move, the way I think, my entire, the person I am, the way I'm navigating this world is a bit like a deer that's just learning to walk. I think, think about Deontay Wilder boxing, right? He's been boxing for so many years, yet his footwork is ab abominable. Is that a word you can use in the English language? Abominable, I'm pretty sure it is, but maybe it's different. In French, it's abominable. Yeah, I could have said abysmal. I guess abominable. Dismal. His footwork is terrible, and yet he's been, he's been a pro boxer for a while. And the thing is, when you practice something that's wrong, or when you don't practice at all, then the result is, you know, you keep making the same mistakes. Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. You have to perfect the right. You have to practice the perfect way of doing something, in order to get it done perfectly, right? And so I've been behaving that way my entire life, and never really took, put the effort in to correct that. I've been standing wrong my whole life, right? And I've never tried to correct it, so it feels right. You know, I've do been doing it for so long that I can't even feel that it's wrong. So it's the same with the way I behave, you know, when, I, when I'm walking around, it's like I'm, I'm walking on ice, I keep stumbling, I forget something, and so that was highlighted. I, I felt it immediately, I just forgot something, what did I just forget, why? So that was, you know, something. It was interesting, the sense of awareness just highlighting the idea that everything matters, the idea that there are tiny things that could be corrected, you know, with patience and discipline, and that I am not even aware of them, like standing, right? So that was interesting, you know, that was illuminating. And I'll probably do it again. The thing with THC and marijuana is that I understand that it's something that could have truly negative impacts. And even in my own family, you know, there's a person that suffered from it. So it's quite scary the idea that I could end up losing myself. You know, what's the, what's the upside? Why take the risk? Well, I can't help wanting to take risks like this. And I, sh I guess I shouldn't go into too much details because, because, but I think I'll keep going. So the first note mentions how I haven't watched my episodes recently. 
as I mentioned in the previous episode. But anytime I do, I feel it's quite useful in the sense that, you know, I talk about what happened in the past week, things I might have learned, things I might have thought about, ideas that I would like to implement, and then I end up just forgetting about them, as stupid as that sounds. And so I go back through the episodes and I think, oh, here, I said something I should correct, something I should do, and I just forgot about it. And I was truly against the idea of putting myself out there, so to speak. My brother, who doesn't even want me to mention him here, doesn't put photos of himself, doesn't put anything out on the internet. He likes his privacy in the sense of you know, not having his life plastered all over the internet for anyone to come and see which I respect and I understand and I felt the same a while ago and part of it is there's the Christopher Nolan the filmmaker he's the same he doesn't I've heard him explain it once he doesn't want people to think about him when they're watching the film he doesn't want people to have this you know this have footage of him have all this information about him so that when they see the film they have this 3D you know they have this character in their heads that they think of whom they think he is. He wants to remain as mysterious as possible so that people engage with the material totally. And he doesn't seem, you know, he's not interested in fame and things like that. And neither am I. And I also think about all the great people that I admire and none of them did that, you know, put themselves out there on purpose, you know, excessively. Most of them kept to themselves, stayed focused, and they definitely didn't covet fame. And so the idea of putting myself out there in any way seemed, you know, what's the word? Counterintuitive. I think about the people I look up to, their journeys, how they got there, and how they are represented. And a big part of their greatness is their mystery, is the fact that we have what they wanted to show us, but the human themselves, we don't have much about that. And I feel like that, you know, that's benefits the persona, the legendary status that some of these people have. But I'm also realizing that I personally, you know, it's not a conscious thing, but I enjoy the idea of revealing in that sense of putting myself out there in the sense of being vulnerable and honest about how I feel, what I'm thinking. You know, there's this weird paradox where I do believe that it's better to remain, you know, to focus on the work and to not do this, to not open up in that way, to not reveal too much. But on the other hand, I have this desire to do so. I have this desire to be vulnerable, to reveal myself. Sounds a bit weird, but that's the, that's the truth. And I suppose the conclusion to this idea, this thought, is that I should do what I feel I should do. I, I should do what I am compelled to do, rather than intellectualize it and think, oh, they did this, they did that, therefore I should replicate that. No, I should... I shouldn't judge myself from the outside and compare myself. I should do, you know, go on my own path. And I believe that this exercise here, I was going to say I can't see the downside, which is completely untrue. There's definitely, there can definitely be downsides. But when I go back through the episodes, you know, I think to myself, soon it will be a year, I'll be able to observe myself a year ago. And that's fascinating. A week ago, a month ago, as my mood, my, my ideas fluctuates. And I think that's fascinating. And so in a sense, I... I feel like any anyone, everyone should try this. It's a fun exercise. And even, and the thing is, even the episodes where the energy is really not there, where it's unstructured, where it's messy, there's always something that I can get out of it. There's always, I can always observe that person and see and learn something. Not learn from that person's ideas, but just learn from seeing myself in the past. There's always something to be gained, I feel. And it's something that keeps renewing. When I look at the episode from last week or the episode from 10 weeks ago, I'm looking at it from my current perspective. 
and I can gain something, maybe I can see something, something that needs to be corrected. But a week from now, I'll be a different person. A week from now, I will have changed to a degree. And I'll be able to look back at this version and at the same versions that I looked at you know, this week, and I feel differently about them. So I can't really pinpoint exactly what the benefit is, but it feels, since I'm always gaining something from it, it feels like it's truly beneficial. It, you know, it's look, like looking in, in the mirror, right? You know, and that's one of the reasons why I try to be as honest as possible, right? Because can you imagine if I do an episode like this and I'm lying? You know, how ridiculous is that? If I'm lying, with the memory I have especially, you know, I'll go back to it a year from now and I'll look at it and I'll believe it. Even a tiny lie. I didn't think about this, right? That's funny. That's a good reason not to lie because, once again, I go back to episodes from a week ago, 10 weeks ago, and I think, oh, that's an interesting thought. Why did I forget about it? Why did I not apply it? Why, you know, why is it gone from my memory? But then if I start lying and I go back to an episode from 10 weeks ago, it's quite likely that I might believe it, especially if it's a small lie. So there's no good reason to tell lies at all because I'll be lying to myself. And I mean, that's the whole concept before, be, behind this idea of you shouldn't lie is when you're lying, you're kind of poisoning your own reality. You're, what's the word, perverting it, you're damaging it, you know, don't lie. Also, last week, a guest at the restaurant told me that my accent as a Frenchman is as bad, so to speak, as pronounced as one of my colleagues, who's also French, whom I know has a more pronounced accent than me. And so when he told me, yeah, your accent is about the same, he was, also, he was also a French guy. When he said, yes, your accent is about the same, I thought, what? I felt insulted, really. Because, you know, I've, I've put a lot of work into trying to sound, you know, trying to iron out that flaw of my French accent, which I do believe, you know, it's part of my personality, of my identity, it's there. But I've put in a lot of work into getting it to where it is. And a lot of French people, when they speak English, they do not put a lot of work, especially if they learned it later in their lives. You know, they keep that strong French accent and it does take effort to, to iron that out. It does. Right now, not right now it, it would take effort for me to speak with a stronger French accent. That's how much work I've put in, into it, that if I, if I want to speak with a French accent, I have to put, you know, I have to put an effort into it. And so this guy says this, and I, you know, I say, uh, I don't think so. And he insists. And the thing is, I've heard my colleagues speak, and I've heard myself speak, because I make a podcast every week and I watch some of them. So I know you're not telling the truth. And so immediately I thought to myself, huh, another benefit of doing the podcast. You know, I don't have to feel hurt or insulted in any way that this person is, you know, discrediting my work, that this person is suggesting that all the work I've put in was for nothing. I don't have to care because I know it's untrue. And so that's another thing, you know, if you don't lie, you know, lying is you're hurting yourself, right? If you're, if you're a person that lies all the time, I imagine you're always thinking about when so a lie is gonna be revealed. It's stressful. I've been in phases where I lied more, especially as a kid. And you're always thinking, you know, it's like planting mines, like explosives. And you're always thinking, when is someone going to step on it and discover it? And it's going to be discovered, right? Whereas if you don't lie, that's a worry you don't have, right? And so this, this approach of telling the truth as much as possible is it's making your life easier in the long run. In the short term, it might make, might make things more difficult, but in the long run, you end up with a more pure reality at your disposal. I was on the bus coming back from work and I heard some kids talking, you know, 14, something like that, 14, 15. And they were talking with this, you know, they were talking a lot of slang with this accent you know, clearly trying to sound tough. 
And just like the way I speak is through a lot of practice, and that's that's how I speak, and it's mostly not conscious. These kids hang around other kids that speak like them, and they've developed this way of speaking, which which is a way of speaking that you wouldn't consider professional, I would say. You don't sound educated and professional or even it takes away from 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 you when you speak that way and I thought about how these are just kids and to them that's the cool way to speak from that they don't see from that perspective that we look at this and think you sound stupid you put effort into sounding that way which is even more stupid and immediately I thought about how that's normal at that age you're trying to re you're trying to rebel against the norm we all go through this some it's more extreme than others and i was thinking about this because my sister is in that age and you know she's acting up she's lying she's doing things she shouldn't and in a way i am worried a little bit you know because you know as i said lying is bad and when you have a kid that's lying continuously or making stuff up you get the sense that you can't trust them and hear, hearing those kids just reminded me that it's kind of normal that wanting to go against the grain to, to be a rebel to get the sense of control over your life by making these choices that go against what adults you know tell you is right it is a way of gaining your sense of you know individuality at that age and it's completely normal and I felt appeasement after hearing those kids that my sister just go is just going through this phase and it's normal and I went through it not as bad as her but I went through it it's normal then a lady got up the stairs wow it's really random a lady went up the stairs you know I was on the top floor on the bus she came up the stairs she was wearing a beige like trench coat and she you know look, I always look at the faces of people coming upstairs I want to see every single face I don't know why I just find it interesting how everyone has a different face so she comes upstairs and her face she looks somewhat beautiful but she has this kind of huge not huge but rather large and oval shaped forehead it's very round so I look at her and I think hmm Once again, I'm, I'm not, I don't know, I don't know how to say this. That's just how I felt at the moment. I thought, mm, she's a bit ugly. And then, I could sense that, I think I, I heard her speaking as she was coming upstairs before I saw her. So I could sense that she was with someone else. And I thought probably her boyfriend. And then he came up the stairs and he had this face. It looked slanted. You know, like you paint a beautiful picture and then you kind of, <laughs> you know mush down the paint before it's dried his face was a bit slanted and he was kind of ugly as well by the way i'm saying this not in the sense that they're ugly and i'm not it has nothing to do with that for for uh, i'm trying to think no it's more a question of perspective i thought mm, that's that's interesting how <laughs> sounds rude but whatever these two ugly <laughs> these two ugly people found each other and I'm, sh I'm not sure, but probably they find each other attractive, visually. You know, probably he sees her face and he thinks that she's beautiful. And she sees his face. And as much as looks aren't as important for a man, they are somewhat important. She sees her fa his face and she thinks that he's attractive, that his face is not you know, that bad. You know, it's that classic thing of two people facing each other and there's a six on the ground. One person sees a six, one person sees a nine. We all have different perspectives. And so, you know, it goes back to the little journey, getting high at work, where it highlighted the sense that my reality, the world I live in, is my perception. You know, when it was enhanced, I felt like that, I felt that strongly. You know, this person doesn't hate me. I got paranoid 
you know, I get paranoid and I decide to just run with that story. Because at the start, what I thought was I could feel things better. So when I started getting paranoid, I thought, ooh, I have a reason to be getting paranoid right now. I have a sixth sense. You know, I'm like Spider-Man. I can sense something bad. And it took me a few minutes to realize, no, no, no. I made up something and then I'm just deciding to run with it and I don't have to. Most of our perceptions are wrong. Especially if you train yourself badly. You know, like someone who's racist and who will think all black people are bad, right? They've just trained themselves that way. And so that's how they see the world. You, know, you imagine a white person living in an area only for black people. With white, <laughs> a white person living in an area only for white people. And then they come out of that area and they have this prejudice. Immediately, every black person is somewhat of a threat. Immediately, they dislike those, those persons, right? Just because they, they have built in this way of perceiving the world. And so to them, that is the world. That's how they see the world. So that is the world, right? And if, you know, like I did in that moment, you, get, you take a step back and you think, wait a minute, are they bad? Or have I just built this narrative that says they're bad? What if I take a step back and actually analyze the situation, you know, and talk to that person and see, mm, assess that person based on who they, who they are. And so on that fateful Saturday, that was highlighted, the sense of how my reality is my perception. And however I feel about something, about myself, about the future, however I feel, I am able, I am allowed to take a step back and analyze how I feel and question it. You know, that was the main takeaway. You're allowed to take a step back and question it. You don't have to run with your first you know, feeling because as I said, our perceptions are often wrong because we have this, our own pasts, our own histories where something might have happened that affected us and we never took the time to take a step back and realize that was an isolated event, for example. I think, I mean, this is a debate that was had a few years ago with Hassan Abi, I think, and, and Andrew Tate, where you know, Hassan was talking about objective truth and facts and Tate was saying that he lives his life according to his experiences. You know, if, but that's what a racist white person does, for example. They might have had a bad experience with a black person and then they decide, okay, black people are evil or black people are bad. That's the same. That, that's the argument he was going with. And Hassan Abi is, you know, arguing that some things are proven. You know, black people are not proven to be inherently bad. So if you decide to live your life that way, that's you, you know, accepting this lens, essentially, that you're going to see the world through. And that's what, that will affect your life negatively. So yeah, to, to close it, you are allowed to take a step back from the way you feel and analyze it. You no. Know, unless you're bad. You know, if you're God, I imagine that your instincts are perfect. But if you're just a human, you need to understand that you are the epitome of imperfection. You're far from perfect. So why just run with the way you feel? Why not analyze it? You know, I keep, I keep, I'm going in circles right now because I'm trying to make it sink into my own head. Why just accept the way you feel? And why not take a step back and analyze it and question why? Just might have learned something. And obviously it's difficult. I understand that it makes sense, but putting it into practice sounds near impossible. Analyze, take a step back. Interesting. I finished the animated video that I've been working on for more than a year. And through that year, I had the number of frames, right? I said this in the last episode. Why is it in my notes? Why am I sabotaging myself? Let me go through. Oh yes, the name of the previous episode. Did I say this in my last episode? Huh. Yeah, you see, you are your worst enemy. 
who cares? I finished the video. Huge weight off of my off of my shoulders. And I start this year with quite a few videos to do just in the first month. So gradually over the years, from two years ago to last year, from last year to this year, it's improving. So heading in the right direction. And I had this background on my phone. There's a note on the door. Huh? There's a note on the door. Well, you put it a bit high up. I'm like five foot. Well, then grow up. Can you put the clue before Bob comes? I'm busy. Um, as I was saying. What was I saying? I was saying. I had this background that said 2760, which was the amount of frames that were needed for the video. And I had it on my screen for over a year. And many times I thought, fuck this, you know. I can just remove the background, put something else, because this is an ugly background. But I felt like it would affect my... It would affect me, and it would make it more likely for me not to finish it if I did. So when I removed it a few days ago, oh, that felt so good. Got my sister instead as a background, midget. And in many ways, it's unsatisfying. It's unsatisfying because it took way too long because there's a lot of uncertainty around it at the moment, around what the outcome will be, what I will get out of it. But the thing is, I finished it. I've never animated anything in my life, and now I have. And it's finished, and it's far from perfect. I don't love it. But it feels good to finish something. When you're a kid, everything is big, right? We all go through trauma, I believe. I think it's most likely the case. And when you're a kid, everything affects you. Because when you're a kid, you're malleable and you're small. Just literally, physically. If, you, if I was a kid, this room would be larger for me, would appear larger. And so, as a kid, you go through these experiences and they affect you. And then you grow up and you realize that you feel like you shouldn't have been affected because as an adult, you wouldn't be affected, right? So you realize that when you, when you become an adult, you realize that as a kid, you're more impressionable and you can get hurt much more easily. And yet when you become an adult, at some point, it seems that rather quickly you forget that and you forget that kids are so impressionable and that you could affect them in a huge way with something that seems innocuous to yourself. It also seems to be the case that that's just the way it is, in a sense. That parents damage their kids and that's just the way it is, some more than others. But you know, being someone who questions things and who likes to look at the past and analyze and see ways in which I was affected as a kid and how as an adult I understand that the adults at the time didn't feel like it was a biggie. I still find it hard to even begin to formulate a way in which I should behave around, you know, to, to have a positive impact and to, to not have a negative impact on children. Because As much as they are these little weak, you know, stupid creatures, not stupid, but you know, less wise and well informed than adults, they are part of the same world, right? They, are, they have access to the same things, especially with the internet and things like that. How, how are you supposed to deal with that? I think I mentioned this before. Right? Seeing a video of some kids, like three years old at a party, some kind of birthday party, and they're all dancing to Cardi B and saying the lyrics. And that's scary. But how the hell are you supposed? You know, you just have to accept that your children will be, to a degree, you know, you can control some, some of that, but to a degree they'll be damaged and poisoned. just the way it is. 
I don't know. I don't know. Control what you can. Alright, finally. Ooh. I don't know why I thought of this recently. But are we alone? Right? It's a question people like to ask from time to time. Do you believe that there are aliens out there? I feel like it is more the question is more interesting than it seems because you're not asking a person whether they know you're not asking a person you know an obvious answer is the universe is so vast you know most likely there are other forms of life out there but i suppose it's a question that reveals how people think right and my you know, I, I always thought personally that there must be life, life out there because the universe is so large. I always thought there must be life out there. And recently I thought to myself, how do I say this? It seems to be clear to me that you, know, you can call it God, whatever you want to call it, the universe. We'll call it God. It's clear to me that God is, you know, if you think of God, it's the greatest artist, you know, ever. The greatest poet, the, cre the greatest comedian, that's God. You know, when I look at my life and the things, you know, that happened, if I am a creation of God and everything around me is a creation of God, then the storyline that he wrote is incredible. And I think it's the case for everyone. It can be incredibly stupid, funny, heartbreaking. But overall, there's something deeply comedic about it when I, you know, take a step back. It's truly funny. And I always think of that when I'm thinking about the future. You know, as someone who overthinks, I'm always trying to predict the future. It's gonna happen this way, it's gonna happen that way, this is gonna happen, that is gonna happen. And I think that most people do that to a degree. And you quickly, quickly realize that it never happens the way you think it will. Almost never. Or even, or usually the thing you want to happen doesn't happen at all. But things rarely happen the way you predict them. You know, it's, and so it's like if you watch a movie and you're trying to predict the ending and the ending surprises you, that feels great. So it feels like, once again, you think of God, he's this masterful storyteller and he's able to always surprise us. And, you know, God is, God is the ultimate poet and the ultimate comedian. I feel like it would be, so the way I'm approaching this question is the life out there is how would the greatest, you know, artist approach crafting this narrative? And my answer is that it's definitely more poetic and funny if there's nothing out there. It's more poetic if we are destined to explore the universe until infinity, you know, eternally. To keep searching for something that isn't there, but never knowing whether there is something out there in the process. That's the beauty of it. I know recently there was trials and all sorts of things sh suggesting that there is life out there, that there are aliens. I'm not buying it. Why is no one talking about it? It didn't receive nearly as much press as the submarine or anything like that. So. Once again, I think that my, my, my approach is how would the greatest storyteller approach crafting this story? I feel like it's more poetic if we keep searching into the, this ex expensive darkness and never finding anything. And it's also funny that we ask ourselves, are we alone when there's seven billions of us? Finally, I had this thought recently as well. But life is like lucid dreaming. Life is like lucid dreaming and some people stop dreaming. Some people approach life like it's this serious thing. So it's a conversation I've had so many times where you end up saying, you only get one life, you know, you need to do the best with it. You only get one, it's so precious, it's a miracle. Think about how unlikely, unlikely life is in general that we are 
in this, what is it called, Go Goldilocks zone, orbiting around the sun that was able to result in life, you know, growing. And then think about how like how lucky you are to be born. All these cells going to the egg in your mother's body, and you're the one who were born who was born. And think about how many people die every day, and how you know lucky you are to be alive. The thing with that approach is that it's so life is so miraculous. Me being here right now is so miraculous that I can't I can't possibly understand how miraculous it is if that makes sense right it's so it's such a miracle that i can't fathom that it is a miracle like small miracles we applaud them which are more you know these huge coincidences that work out for the better seem like this beautiful thing but being alive currently is something that's sometimes hard to appreciate and I don't feel like saying that life is this huge miracle helps. But I was thinking about, you know, how do I phrase it? How do I illustrate my point? And I thought maybe life is like lucid dreaming. Like life is like a dream. And, you know, it often feels like it. As I said, this idea that God is this, you know, artist, this storyteller. Life often feels like the greatest movie. When when you learn that there's people going in a submarine, billionaires, to see the wreck of the Titanic, and they end up dying in the process. I mean, how poetic and funny and ridiculous is this? And then when you add to that the fact that everyone around the Earth was paying attention to that story unfolding, right, as if it mattered to them. And then when you take into account the fact that perhaps the reason... Fuck, my camera shut off. God damn! How long? Why you do this? Ooh! -wee. Tell me you didn't. Still recording. Yeah, a situation like this, when you take a step back and you analyze it, it's so, you know, it's so funny and stupid and crazy and sad and everything at the same time, right? And how could you look at this and not think that life is magical, that it's this dream that doesn't make sense at times, that's so strange at times? And I feel like some people decide to take it seriously, to think, and you know, for some people it's much easier than for others to embrace the dream. Like for myself, living in London, having a roof over my head, having two parents that love me. Life has certainly been nice and soft and easy for me. But it doesn't change the fact that there are people who've had much harder lives than me who have embraced this concept. But you have people out there who decide to live their life as if it's not a miracle, as if it's not a dream and a magical thing. As if it's not the greatest you know, story ever told. They decide to just settle for the least. To stop living. And... You know, I've had this discussions with people like this so many times. And the thing is that I have faith in the idea that this is true. But how do you communicate that? And how do you change someone's mind? That's difficult. And when you realize that it's difficult to change someone's mind, you question yourself. You know, do I truly believe this? Is it true? Why can't I make people understand? I think it's attributed to Einstein, this idea that if you can't explain a concept to a 12-year-old, then you don't understand it yourself. So th the point is, if you're not able to communicate the idea succinct succinctly and concisely, if you're not able to get rid of all the fat and bring it to its essence, then you don't really get it. And it's funny, in fact, that a lot of people are like that. A lot of people, famous people, people who talk about certain subjects, they know the script to a degree and they know all, they, they are able to repeat all that is the fat of the subject, 
but they don't have a true understanding of the essence of what the subject means. And I have been that many times in my life where I saw a subject and I did a bit of research on it and then I felt like I could talk about it to people. And you meet the right person and they'll poke holes into it and immediately you think, oh, I guess I was fooling myself. I don't truly understand it or I don't truly believe it. And I feel like in a way it is, since it's something I've done so many times, I feel like the reason I'm compelled to do this is because it is in a way my mission in life, as weird as that sound, to try to communicate this idea that you should never act as if life is a job, is a serious thing. You should always take a step back and understand that it's this crazy lucid dream, this crazy miracle that makes no sense, this crazy comedy, this crazy drama, this horror film, everything at once. And you should embrace the fact that you're a, a part of it. And you should embrace the fact that crazy things happen, that you should never count yourself out. As long as you're alive, you're living the dream. It's when you start to cut yourself off from that dream that, you know, it stops happening. Alright, I'm done.